Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for CA Bootcamp Module 4, Office Managers and Compliance Officers. This is going to be part one. Just a reminder, there is no audio or video taping allowed and any unauthorized reproduction, dispensing, forwarding, or copying of this target coding presentation is illegal. My name is Natasha Beard Stapleton. I'm the Executive Director here at Target Coding. I also head up the HIPAA compliance program here at Target Coding, as well as uh, facilitate CA trainings. And I am the one that coordinates all the webinars and seminars and CE credits for Target Coding as well. Dr. Marty Kotler is the president of Target Coding, and he is also certified in billing and coding compliance. He's also the author of our guidebook. If you haven't had a chance to check out our guidebook, you can find that on our website. But also, I would definitely, if you've never heard him speak, I would check out our YouTube channel and get acquainted with him. He definitely has a different perspective being that he's a chiropractor and certified in compliance, and it's always um, a treat to hear him listen as well. Today we have Brandy Brimhall with us, and as you can see, she's a certified professional coder, certified professional compliance officer. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for CA Bootcamp Module 4, Office Managers and Compliance Officers. This is part one. Just a reminder, note there is no audio or video taping allowed and any unauthorized reproduction, dispensing or forwarding or copying of this target coding presentation is illegal. My name is Natasha Beard Stapleton. I'm the executive director here at Target Coding and I head up all of our HIPAA compliance services as well as our staff uh, and CA trainings modules. And I coordinate all of our seminars and webinars here at Target Coding. Dr. Marty Kotler is the president of Target Coding, and he's a certified billing and compliance specialist. He's also the author of many compliance and documentation training manuals, guidebooks, and articles. If you haven't had a chance to hear him speak any time um, in the if you haven't had a chance to hear him speak in person, I would definitely check out our YouTube channel. Uh, you, there's a library of different courses that he's taught, and I would definitely take the time to listen to him. He definitely has a great perspective, not only from a compliance perspective, but also as a chiropractor. Today we have Brandy Brimhall. She is a certified professional coder, certified professional compliance officer, and as you can see, she um, is also a medical auditor. She's also been a contributing writer to many numerous publications and is a guest speaker at Nationwide Chiropractic Seminars. It's always a pleasure to have her um, join us, especially for CA Boot Camp, because me and her really love compliance, and this is probably one of our favorite modules that we put together. And out of all of our CA uh, bootcamp modules, we have um, four modules. Each module is two parts for a total of eight classes. So we're rounding towards the end of our modules here. If you didn't get a chance to join us for module one, which was front desk and patient relations, and module uh, two for billing and collections, or module three, which was therapy and back office, I would definitely suggest um, get it listening to those recordings or um, asking to be able to add that on to your purchase. It's definitely a great learning tool for your staff and a training modules you can use later on. Um, it's something that you can add to your training protocols and your onboarding for new staff. So I think it's a great tool to utilize for your office in the future. But today we're gonna be concentrating primarily on compliance and we're going to be introducing you to HIPAA, OIG, and OSHA. Um, we are also going to explain why compliance matters, what the most common office policies are to be using, and how compliance saves you time and money. So compliance in a chiropractic office is something that is crucial and sometimes uh, forgotten about. A lot of times when we work with offices they uh, will start a compliance program or purchase a manual and then it's forgotten about or put up on a shelf and it's never readdressed. So 
Today, we're really going to hone in on the three prongs of compliance. We're going to be talking about OIG, which is preventing fraud and abuse. We're also going to be talking about HIPAA, which is protecting patient health information, and OSHA, which is workplace safety and health protection. And a lot of times, uh, you know, we say, why is compliance important for a chiropractic assistant? Well, CAs perform numerous roles in chiropractic offices, and they are responsible for protecting sensitive patient information, creating information that, that patient information. They also, a lot of times, are involved in insurance billing and coding. They're involved in training. They, they're educators not only to uh, to the patients in a lot of um, respects. Sometimes they're the junior IT. Um, person in your office, and they do just a myriad of different um, things in the office. So it's something that since CAs are playing so many types of roles in a chiropractic office, it's really important to have good understanding of basic compliance requirements. So to start, I'm going to go ahead and give the controls off to Brandy so she can get us started with OIG, the Office of Inspector General. Thank you, Natasha. I'm just switching over to get the screen share to load properly. All right. Um, as we get started in compliance uh, in the chiropractic office, kind of the first thing to share with you is compliance was always intended to be certainly something that's uh, you know necessary for us to implement in our clinics for lots of lots of different reasons. But compliance processes should be really looked at as how can we infuse this into our regular or existing systems and procedures so that we're not creating extra work for us? Now, granted, with compliance, as with billing and as with other things that we do, there's always going to be you know, work and extra work involved. But once again, as we go through a lot of this, just consider how or what may need to be done in your clinic to infuse compliant protocols into your existing uh, systems and protocols, because that has helped me in our clinics and lots of other clinics really just make sure that we're not, you know, finding ourselves, you know, feeling frustrated or feeling like we can't get to something or can't do something. So as we get started today, I want to, Natasha uh, touched on um, some of these things here. So I'm just going to scroll a little bit past it and get started here with the Office of Inspector General. So this is the OIG, and you have probably heard this term many of times before. And really just to introduce them, this is uh, the Department of Health and Human Services under OIG is the largest Inspector General's office under the federal government. The reason this is significant is because this uh, particular office is really certainly dedicated to a lot of things, but their uh, top priority, if you will, is combating fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, in the health and human services program. So in other words, in healthcare, the coding, the billing, the uh, how providers are established as practices, how we refer back and forth to one another of the same and different specialties, lots and with lots of different things like that, how we communicate to and collect from our patients, from our referral sources, and the list goes on. So we hear about this and we think, geez, there's an awful lot of regulatory stuff that goes on and the reality of it is that is certainly true but once again as we go through i think that you'll probably see why some of these things are in place and why it's necessary and again how you can infuse this into your existing policies procedures protocols and things like that it's important to note that the majority of the sources or resources under the health and human services oig department really are dedicated specifically to Medicare, Medicaid, because those are government programs, right? However, with that being said, there was actually uh, quite some time ago, a number of publications that came out. And one of them that I really loved that said, uh, one of the statements was where Medicare goes, the world will follow. And really what that was saying was, Medicare is really the foundation of everything for all of our third party payers from where state laws even come into place as far as uh, our healthcare rules and regulations. So Medicare is the foundation. And because of that, whether or not you're billing to Medicare or Medicaid, this is always of interest to you because it is those types of investigations that like the under, you know, our commercial insurances aren't federal payers. With that being said, 
it doesn't take much to extend beyond the federal guidelines to where what would be originally a civil case would then rise to the level of a federal case. And so again, where Medicare goes, the world will follow. And so we want to make sure that we know the importance of this particular department and why regardless of our practice type, that we are aware of what's taking place and doing our best to, uh, you know, to follow the guidelines that are in place for us. So the uh, Health and Human Services OIG department, uh, our, their mission, like I mentioned, is to prevent healthcare fraud. Uh, and when they can, when they are prosecuting or when they're considering cases, they, of course, they look at a number of different things, but they look at a few things that we wanted to share with you today. One of them is just simply the nature and the seriousness of the offense, which that takes us down uh, the fraud, waste and abuse category, which I'll explain to you in greater detail a little bit later. Uh, the pervasiveness of the wrongdoing, any history of similar conduct. And so if you think about from the insurance credentialing side of, of the things, if you've been around for very long, you probably, I mean, for a number of years, I guess I should say, you probably remember when we used to enroll with Cigna and then Blue Cross and then Aetna and we had all of these, you know, every single payer, we had a, we had different uh, process to, to get enrollments and it was before NPIs. So we got a provider ID for each one. Well, one of the things that happened to allow uh, this industry to better detect and communicate fraud, waste, and abuse amongst our payers is the development of the CAQH enrollment portal, of course, and other enrollment portals that exist in some different places, but the NPI numbers that we have. And so that kind of created an expressway, I guess, if you will, for payers to, or payer networks to communicate with one another other specific findings that may put other payers and networks at risk. And so that is significant. It was to me at the time because I watched all of this unfold because I have been around for a really long time to see how it was before and how it is now. And so with that being said, their expectation is always that we would really, of course, follow the guidelines that are in place for us and really police ourselves and one another to some extent. But they have also on the back side of things, if you will, really created systems that allow for more enhanced communication across our payers and payer networks uh, in order to help third party payers detect fraud, waste and abuse, be aware of audits taking place and recoupments and all of that under other payer umbrellas. And so that's why if you happen to be in a clinic that you get hit with this audit from one payer and then you know more than are you know getting to the other side of it perhaps or in the middle of it, there's something else going on with another payer it's, it's because they have that ability to communicate with one another. Certainly it could be because of other things as well, but they're all things that we, things that we need to know about because it really, uh, as long as we're seeing patients, there's no such thing as under the radar. So they do look for our his, their history of similar conduct is what I was uh, alluding to when I started down that pathway of explaining that, but they can see of course, and communicate what is going on, what was going on and what's taken place with individual providers and facilities amongst or across other payers and payer networks. Uh, they also look at when they're evaluating or investigating, they look at the existence and adequacy of your existing compliance program. So if you've taken any compliance uh, classes or courses before, one of the things that they uh, continue to reinforce and remind everyone is that uh, not having any compliance plan or program in place is far worse than having one uh, that you don't know what it is and don't follow. So for those clinics that may have compliance related documents, a compliance plan or compliance program that is, you know, maybe still wrapped in plastic or that no one's looked up or, uh, you know, has spent any time training on, that's an increased risk to your practice. And I want to just really kind of underline that by saying, I'm definitely not suggesting not to have something because the risk to that is quite substantial and it's really not if something happens, it's when something happens because there's just so many pathways uh, under these umbrellas and compliance that we're going to go over today that you can see create risk for a practice. And of course, we always want providers to have their risk minimized, their billers to have their mis risk minimized, and certainly for everyone to be in the best position to get paid properly for what they're doing and to keep the money that they have been paid. So the compliance program, according to these rules, has seven elements that are required. One of them includes written policies and procedures. Another is having a designated compliance officer. So this is the go-to person for when there's a question for maybe spearheading to making sure that training is conducted, that things are properly documented, that there's a policy and procedures in place, those types of things. 
Technics having effective compliance training uh, and education for your office personnel. Making sure you have accessible and compliant lines of communication for reporting uh, non-compliance. And so when something happens, who do you go to? How is this documented? How quickly it does, is it uh, being reported? All of the things along those lines. Next, regular internal monitoring and auditing of compliance. And this is really just uh, almost, it's more extensive than what I'm, you know, in the nutshell I'm about to put it in. But in summary, it is really just making sure that the wheels keep turning in the right direction and that these processes are free of interferences. Next is the enforcement of standards through well-publicized disciplinary guidelines. And this is addressing what happens under certain circumstances when non-compliance occurs. And granted, we don't have a way in many cases because one of the things offices always ask is how could I possibly know that? And certainly as you go through and develop uh, your or review your compliance program, you'll see that there are certain, non certain actions of non-compliance that would warrant training or that would warrant perhaps a demotion or that would warrant even referral to law enforcement and certainly you know there's multiple of steps in between the one end of the spectrum to the other to determine what that would look like but you do uh, need to make sure that it's clear what uh, the vulnerability to workforce is by conducting themselves in a non-compliant way and then next we have documentation and prompt response to detected offenses with corrective actions taken. Just this week, actually, I think it actually occurred last week is when I learned about it, but just this week I've spent uh, quite a bit of time working with a clinic that has had an offense and uh, they, you know, it was detected. And so what steps need to be taken? Uh, how is it being investigated? How is it mitigated? All of those different types of things. And so in real time right now, I'm literally, in a, and I always am to some extent, but right now just so happens to be one of the moments that I'm deep into the trenches with a situation like this with a clinic. And it is interesting to see where there were gaps in their processes, in their training, in their documentation, all of those types of things that ultimately has resulted in a, an unintentional uh, issue that is going to end up being quite costly. So you're never off the radar. Uh, speaking of costly, non-compliance does cost. And so the rules and regulations are quite complex in the little over an hour that Natasha and I are going to spend with you today. We're really just going to skate the surface as far as um, all of the details and moving parts to compliance. What we really want to make sure that we enforce today is really uh, you know, giving a good high level introduction with the value of having this implemented in your facility and of course having uh, you know, your, the proper training, monitoring and all of those types of things. Um, as far as the cost of non-compliance, once again, this is uh, one end of the spectrum to another. Uh, it can be uh, anything from civil sanctions, which are fines and other types of things, civil monetary penalties, which are also different levels of fines, uh, and there could also be extensive liability. So that includes jail time and various things like that. I definitely don't want to be you know, the Debbie Downer and always present the worst case scenario, uh, but I think it is something that we need to be aware of because it's in those times, just like in the situation I'm dealing with right now, uh, which I don't believe will, it'll land somewhere in the, you know, the low to mid end of the spectrum, but it's still costly, still unimaginably stressful for those that are going through it. But uh, I, I just I want to make sure that we all really understand that we are, you know, again, not under the radar, that it's the things that you don't ever think will happen that suddenly happens and it catches you off guard. And then all of your time, your attention, your everything is put into dealing with is this issue that really you no longer have that much control over. And it, it's definitely been interesting for me these past few days uh, walking through this with that clinic. So I want to introduce you to one of the acts under the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, OIG, under their compliance guidelines, and this is the False Claims Act. And really, this, in summary, uh, this protects the government or protects the third party payer from being overcharged or sold substandard goods or services. And so we could go into this, you know, at a granular level and talk about uh, our billing codes and our procedure codes and what we're expecting for reimbursement. For those of you that may be enrolled with DME and selling supplies to patients, we could even go down that uh, rabbit hole because all of that is related to this. 
And really what the payers are, what the intent of this act is to protect the payers from being bilked, from being having uh, incorrect code and being uh, expected to reimburse services that weren't billed, services that aren't coded correctly, uh, over being overcharged for services or items based upon the value or the time that's spent for them, all of those types of, of scenarios. So the False Claims Act does impose civil and criminal penalties, which, you know, of course, are ex ex extensive and expensive, I should say. And this could be for anyone who knowingly submits or causes to be submitted a false or fraudulent claim, conspires to defraud the payer. And by conspiring, that means are we, uh, you know, having some kind of we know or should know, right? That's actually what it says in the Federal Register is either we know or we should know. And of course, we we, it's one or the other. So that really broadens their ability to uh, come and address this from the False Claims Act perspective and say this was intentional because you either knew or you should know or should have known. Uh, next is you knowingly make, use, or cause to be made or use a false record or statement. And keep in mind that false statement could be and often is in healthcare a claim that's submitted for uh, you know too many units, services that weren't billed properly, maybe the TENS unit that cost you $30 and that you're billing $700 for it to the third party payer, those types of things. And so that is, uh, you know, bilking the, the payer and it falls under the fraud, waste and abuse category. What the False Claims Act does not cover is mistakes, accidents or negligence. And so, you know, the revenue cycle system and billing is, uh, you know, it's imperfect. It's always going to be, but the intent is that we are following compliant procedures, but certainly next that we are in a position with compliant pro plans and programs to find and fix our own mistakes before our third party payers do. One of the ways that they identify that, frankly, is just by the patterns in our billing. If this issue is something that's been going on for a long period of time, it's certainly done intentionally and, and most definitely if it's never been addressed or corrected. So the False Claims Act also doesn't, uh, you know, it's difficult to, you're really guilty until proven innocent, I guess is what I want to say here. And so it's difficult for us to communicate that, oh, this was an accident when the pattern of this is something that's been ongoing, when we either don't have or aren't following compliant programs in place that should be in place in our clinics. Moving forward, I just want to share with you, this is the a snip of the reverse side of the claim form. And so if you're not familiar with the claim form, this is actually, uh, it's either, most of the time we send them out electronically, but it's the red and white HICFA or CMS 1500 that we send to our third party payers, paper or electronic. And the reverse side of this says a few things that I love to share all the time with, uh, with clinics. And it really, it just says in submitting this claim for payment, I certify, and that I is the provider signature that's on the face of uh, this claim. And that's why, that's what validates it is this provider signature, which is an attestation of all of the things I'm about to share with you. So it says, I certify that the information on this form is true, accurate, and complete, meaning we're agreeing and certifying that we've sub we're submitting clean claims. Next, I have familiarized myself with all applicable laws, regulations, and program instructions, which are available to me by my third party payer. I have provided or I will provide sufficient information required to allow the payer to make an informed eligibility and payment decision. So if we're asked for additional information, we're going to comply. And then the next thing I wanna share with you is it says this claim, whether submit by me, and again, that's the provider, or on my behalf by my DESIC billing company or billing personnel, so this is addressing the billers as well, complies with all applicable uh, program instructions or laws, regulations, and program instructions for payment. Uh, and it goes on to say, including but not limited to the federal anti-kickback, physician self-referral, Stark Law, and so forth. And then the next one says, the services on this form were medically necessary and either personally furnished by me or incident two. So we're not gonna go into the incident two guidelines, but typically in the chiropractic setting, they're personally furnished by the chiropractic provider, uh, but it addresses medical necessity here. And of course, we know that the foundation for coverage for all third party claims, and we're expecting insurance to consider for reimbursement, the foundation in order to access coverage, regardless of the provider's in or out of network status, is that the care being provided is medically necessary. And so it actually addresses that on the reverse of the claim form. 
So we want to make sure that we're preventing fraud, waste, and abuse, which is preventing, uh, you know, not making the false statements. So, so making sure that we're submitting clean claims. Uh, fraud could be billing for services that either weren't provided or altering claims to receive a higher payment. Uh, next, abuse could be, uh, it's either practices that are directly or indirectly result in unnecessary costs to the government programs. This could be incorrect coding, and it could be billing for medically unnecessary services. But you can see here how the lines are really blurred in this situation as to what's really fraud and what's really abuse. And so that's where it goes back to what I was mentioning a moment ago, is we're almost guilty until we prove ourselves innocent. And the only way to do that is by having a compliance plan in place. And so extra, extra important to know that because that's either going to be our saving grace or it is potentially going to put us in a position that we have to find a way to prove that this isn't fraud, so deliberate intent, but rather it's an abuse that falls under that category. Unimaginably difficult to do. Um, the next thing to pro probably share with you is that there is under these guidelines what they call the whistleblower. Uh, and it is also known as the key Tom guideline. And so the key Tom is, or not key Tom, but that, that all, all that means is whistleblower. But the sum of it is, this could be someone who either isn't, who literally is in a position to know that there's fraud or abuse taking place. And of course they blow the whistle. And so we see that in different things in, you know, all over the place uh, on the news and that type of thing, but it happens all the time in healthcare. In fact, this is one of the most common ways that a provider will land in some type of investigation at this level. Certainly not the only way. So definitely don't um, think that if, if you know everyone in the office is happy, you don't have a whistleblower because it doesn't have to be that. It could be patterns in billing. It could be reports from other payers. The list goes on and on, but there are advantages to the whistleblowers because they actually, uh, after the investigation is completed, they actually can be paid a portion of what is recovered from that investigation as their reward for uh, blowing the whistle. So lots of different ways to, again, either police ourselves or be policed by those amongst us. And that's really what this is all about, because the federal government certainly doesn't have near the manpower and nor would they ever be able to have enough boots on the ground to go through every single situation and every single type of healthcare facility and all the other businesses, of course, that they are regulating, monitoring, and those types of things. And so just like with other industry, uh, people are required to police themselves, self-report, report on others, but we're given guidelines to follow to you know, avoid those types of scenarios. So another element under this is the Stark Law. This is also known as the Physician Self-Referral Law. And this prohibits a provider from referring Medicare patients specifically, but it does apply to other types of patients as well. Again, where Medicare goes, the world will follow. And this is for designated health services to an entity in which the physician or the provider or, or an immediate family member to them has a financial relationship unless an exception applies. And so unless the, the scenario that you have is really distinctly outlined in the exceptions, the absolute best next step for you is to speak with a qualified healthcare attorney to evaluate your situation and they'll be able to give you guidance, document for you what you need to do or if they believe that you are meeting some type of exception under Stark. Extra important to do that. And so, uh, you know, one example is I'm, I'm not a doc, but if I were and I had, you know, a spouse that had a you know PT facility down the street or even in the same bu building a separate business and we're referring back and forth this is specifically saying that's a violation of the Stark law and you can't do that because of these various reasons once again we're going through everything so high level today if this is a topic you'd like to learn more about in more granular detail please let us know as the same applies to all of the other topics because we could really we could spend an entire hour just talking about Stark itself uh, our mission for today is really just to kind of navigate from one end of compliance to the other, pulling out a lot of the highlights that providers need to know. So the Stark Law applies to referrals from a physician or provider for designated health services that are included in the list that you see um, in that first lengthy list of bullet points. So it could be PT, lab services, occupational therapy, speak la speech language pathology, uh, radiation therapy, DME and supplies, and the list goes on. Um, there are exceptions that exist. And again, like I mentioned, if you have any question or concern, 
the worst thing you can do is guess or assume or to assume that somehow you're under the radar. There's no such thing as that. You definitely want to uh, meet with someone just to make sure that you get uh, a proper legal opinion. Uh, and really this prevents overutilization of services. It has uh, a lot to do with making sure that there's not, patients aren't being taken advantage of. And uh, it, even beyond that, individual states, some of them have expanded stark regulations based upon issues that they've encountered within their state. So uh, once again, even knowing what state you're in, definitely reach out to us if you're wondering where to figure out if you're, you know, if this is, if there are extra laws or guidelines for you under your state or meet with an attorney. Uh, just like everything under compliance, there are penalties for being in violation. Once again, really quite costly. I so happen to be working with another clinic right now indirectly on uh, making sure that they are not uh, in violation of Stark because they're making multiple changes in their clinic. And so they by no means are in any trouble or having any having any issues. It's just they're taking that proactive pathway to make sure that the steps that they're taking for their business are not going to put them at risk under any of these guidelines. And one of them that they're specifically looking at right now is the Stark Law because of uh, how their business is set up and the multiple multiple providers within it. Next, we have the anti-kickback statute, and this actually makes it a crime to knowingly and willfully solicit, receive, offer, or pay any remuneration. And remuneration is any type of fear reward uh, for referring or arranging for services payable by any state or federal healthcare program, or purchasing, leasing, ordering, or arranging for any goods, facilities, or services that must be paid for uh, by any federal or state health care program. And so in other words, this prevents us from offering any type of payment or reward for those that may be um, referring over to us or that we're referring to. So we need to make sure, again, if you have that kind of scenario going on for your business, there are definitely rules that you need to be aware of and not to go through the numbers and the details, but here again, you know, really every aspect of the uh, under these guidelines, they all have teeth. What I have learned over the years is that when a facility, regardless of the size or the type, uh, finds themselves in violation of one of these types of statutes, it almost always affects others. And so rarely do you find that it's just anti-kickback or just uh, the False Claims Act, but there's other things going on too. And so really it causes those penalties and the risk to multiply many times over in a lot of cases. So uh, it's not hardly ever seemingly isolated to just one thing. Another perfect example here is fee splitting. And so this is related to, um, you know, paying uh, on a per person basis for referral of patients. One of the places you might recognize this is in Groupon. Uh, so this is a common place for clinics especially you know massage facilities acupuncture facilities sometimes chiropractic offices do it i see periodically uh, and what you do is you you know post advertise through group group on and then that organization keeps part of that money so that's considered fee splitting certainly there are multiple other examples but there again it uh you know is one of those things that's highly advised against and addressed actually very specifically um, under the guidelines for compliance. And so it also causes us to be in violation here potentially for discounting, potential dual fee schedules and things like that. So this once again lends to what I was mentioning a moment ago. It's almost like a domino effect. When you find that you're in violation of one area, there's almost always something else that's so closely attached to it that there's risk in that area too and usually violations. And so uh, just you know, making sure that we know those guidelines so that we know what we can and can't do. Uh, so under uh, the fee splitting, what we can't can't do is we cannot offer discounted or free services for referrals. Uh, so even you know the birthday visits, that type of thing that the clinics used to do back in the day. Hopefully, no one does it now. Uh, we can't do those types of things. You want to make sure that you know your state guidelines regarding discounting. Uh, if, if some states do have that outlined specifically, others are going to refer you right to these rules that we're talking about here and telling you you need to follow the OIG guidelines. Uh, if you are looking at discounting for self-pay patients or patients with you know, limited coverage or exhaustive benefits, that type of thing, 
You can also go to Cairo Healthy USA, which is you know uh, also known. You see probably choose this stuff all the time online. Uh, go to them. They're an excellent, excellent resource to help uh, ensure that your fee schedules are compliant. We also can't offer flat rate services, and what that ultimately means is you can't say we every patient that comes in we do spinal adjustment. Uh, manual therapy and you know whatever else we do and we just charge one rate for no matter what it is of how whatever dollar amount you can't do that every individual service needs to have its individual fee uh, i mentioned the birthday visits we're not allowed to do that and we can't offer incentives for referrals and so you know that's goes and again this goes back also potentially to anti-kickback right so that's fee splitting potentially and anti-kickback uh, we also are not allowed, regardless of our enrollment status, to waive co-pays, co-insurances, and deductibles. Next, uh, we want to make sure that we have addressed, you know, these uh, common terms. Uh, fraud is, you know, knowing and willful, right? So this, but the difference is how do we prove that it wasn't, it was, you know, abuse, that it wasn't intentional, knowingly or willfully, especially when the False Claims Act in the Federal Register, those guidelines say the, the provider, facility, or individual either knows or should have known. And so fraud is knowing and willful. Abuse is uh, practices that are inconsistent with sound fiscal, business, or medical practices that result in unnecessary cost to payers. And that's, again, so vague. It's so easy to uh, for that to be elevated or escalated to the level of fraud unless other information becomes available that shows that it didn't rise to that level, which again, that's your compliance plan or compliance program. And then we go into waste and error. So waste could be, uh, you know, misuse of resources. It could be overutilization of services. So for example, maybe billing too many units or time therapies for a period of time could be overutilization, which would be waste. But at the same time, you can also see, was it knowingly and willfully? If so, was it fraud? Or was there a misunderstanding of the payer rules and the coding guidelines to where this would have just been abuse? Or was it waste and error? Waste and error are typically related to one another. So, and it even it says in their guidelines, waste is often due to error, which means the expectation is that would be something that occurred you know once or on a very short term it was identified and corrected so there's lots of things that you can learn in an investigation that would lend to one uh, avenue or another under the fraud waste and abuse uh, so consequences under fraud waste and abuse as with everything else these areas all certainly have teeth it could be civil monetary penalties criminal convictions and fines civil prosecution uh, imprisonment, loss of license, exclusion from federal health care pro programs, which means you wouldn't be eligible for billing, the minimum time that that would be, uh, you'd be excluded. And by the way, it's not just providers that get excluded, but other individuals can be excluded too for lots of different reasons. But the minimum time frame is five years. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have policies and procedures in place to address the fraud, waste, and abuse. So important to make sure that you have that, make sure that new team members are trained, make sure that uh, your policies and procedure manuals are up to date and are accessible all of the things that you know you would just like if you were following a gps for on your your phone to drive from one place to another you'd have that there and accessible so you could follow that map or use it as a resource when you weren't sure what to do what step what which turn to take that type of thing that's what our policies and procedures do for us uh, under these guidelines Shifting gears now into a different area of compliance and just really to quickly recap that which we just discussed is just a small fraction of what does come under the OIG. Uh, we definitely, you know, again, please let us know if you have any questions because we can go into the more granular detail on all of that uh, in individual segments as we need to to assist you specifically. Uh, but moving into another branch of compliance, we're going to talk about OSHA. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this and then hand the baton over to Natasha because she's going to be going through the HIPAA segment with you. But as we go through the OSHA, uh, this is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and their primary mission is to address workforce safety. And so this has not as much to do with business operations, policies, and procedures like we talked about under OIG. 
not anything to do with patient privacy and patient protection like you would see under HIPAA, but this is really to address your team members and the personnel that are responsible for conducting the day-to-day -day activities in the business. And so there's areas of compliance. You almost look at it kind of like a big pie. You know, there's the uh, business operations and administrative under OIG. There's the patient protections and administration under that under HIPAA. And then there's the workforce protection and all of that under OSHA. And we don't think about that as much in healthcare, specifically our industry of healthcare with chiropractic, because it addresses workforce safety. And certainly in chiropractic, we tend to think, well, our risk of getting injured on the job is pretty limited. I mean, and we tend to immediately think of, you know, someone falling off a ladder, that kind of thing. But uh, there are different ways that this Im impacts us, a number of them actually. So I'm going to address this, but beyond all of that, OSHA is actually a required component of compliance. And without uh, having OSHA addressed, you haven't fully addressed all of the compliance requirements that you'd be obligated to for your healthcare business. So OSHA addresses workforce safety, minimizes risk of illness and injury on the job, does allow for greater productivity within the workforce. Uh, the result of that is uh, patients, or not patients, uh, workforce members take less days off work for illness and injury. Uh, it does help to cultivate better employer-employee relationships and decreased expense and liabil liability for the employers. Uh, OSHA is an interesting, I, I certified in OSHA, I actually did it twice because I thought it was so much fun. I did that under the all the compliance stuff too, uh, just and, and coding, I guess, as far as that goes. I just, I guess I had so much fun with all of it, I just get two of everything or three. But beyond that, um, OSHA is a federal program, uh, but like I was mentioning under like the Stark Law under OIG, OSHA does have a little bit of a different approach to it. So states are also allowed to have their own state OSHA program. And what the federal program says is our rules all apply everywhere in every single state and territory. However, if a state comes to us and said we need and says we need more stringent rules more expanded guidelines based upon what's taking place in our state, uh, a state can actually be eligible for their state approved plan. And the federal government or the federal OSHA says that their, the state plan has to be at least as effective as, which means it has to be at least as strict as the federal plan, but any states that believe there needs to be more strict guidelines or additional guidelines under OSHA for something else, uh, then they can work with the federal government to have their state approved plan. And so with that being said, you can see the map on the screen here. So uh, every state in blue and territory uh, does have their own uh, state approved OSHA plan. Much of the time it's because of some type of industry within that state that would require the OSHA program to be expanded for whatever is going on or has gone on in that state that needs to be addressed more specifically than what the federal plan does. So if you happen to be in one of the states that are blue, uh, then you would go to your state OSHA program to gather that additional information, understanding they're going to also reference the federal plan too, because that still is always going to apply, but there's gonna be areas that are more strict uh, for that, those states in the blue color. So the thing with OSHA inspections, uh, they are conducted without advance notice, just like audits and things like that that take place and investigations under other areas of compliance. No one's going to call and schedule with you. They just show up. Uh, they can conduct on-site inspections or phone and even fax investigations or they're calling and gathering information, uh, that type of thing. Uh, highly trained compliance officers, and I'll tell you, I have met a couple of these OSHA investigators incredibly intelligent people, very, very detail oriented, and they know exactly what they're looking for, exactly why they're there. And they don't just come into a facility and, uh, uh, you know, address the reason that they were, you know, if it was a whistleblower or whatever reason that they had presented for them, maybe there was an issue, an issue as far as a sickness and illness or an injury that took place that would prompt them to come. They don't just look to address and evaluate that situation. They say, while I'm here, I'm going to go through everything. So incredibly interesting to uh, to watch and walk alongside. Uh, but they do have some inspection priorities, and so they're going to look for imminent danger, catastrophes and fatalities, 
worker complaints and referrals, and this is where our area of healthcare, actually a lot of areas in healthcare, is going to uh, fall. Uh, and then targeted inspections, so it could be high injury or high illness rates, and they also do follow-up inspections. And so once they're there, you can almost rest assured that they're definitely going to be back. It could be months, it could be years, but uh, they're definitely going to be keeping their eyes open. Uh, if you want to learn more about OSHA, you can go to that website we have there on the screen. Uh, but uh, I want to just cover a few high-level pieces with you before um, I pass off to Natasha. The OSHA penalties, once again, like everything else, uh, are significant and quite expensive. They add up and they multiply. Uh, most of the time under OSHA, these types of uh, investigations, which of course prompt the, the penalties and things along those lines, are often prompted by complaints from a former employee, but it doesn't have to be the case. It could be there's multiple illnesses that come out of your facility, maybe an injury, that all has to be reported. And once that occurs, then of course OSHA is aware that something's going on and they wanna make sure that there isn't any ongoing risk to your workforce. Uh, OSHA can conduct a minimal investigation, so it can be fairly isolated, uh, or they can, can conduct a more expanded investigation. In the time I have spent in this area, I have learned that they do really address everything that they can. And frankly, I would too. If I was an OSHA investigator and I was had the ability to you know, go and tell everyone, here's how you can protect yourself and here's what you're doing to put your workforce at risk, and by the way, these are all of the penalties. It would be really easy in many, many places, not just healthcare, of course, but uh, to, to violate or to put together healthy fines. So here's a snapshot of what the penalties look like uh, for OSHA. One thing that I wanna share with you really as far as this screen goes is that up until 2016, and that's why that's in that center column, OSHA's penalties have been in place for 25 years and so far as long as OSHA had been a thing and the penalties and the cost of the penalties had never changed. On August, the, or as of August 1st of 2016, uh, that rule was changed or that law rather was changed saying that OSHA, that area of compliance has the ability to increase their penalties on an annual basis. And certainly they have done that. I believe they've increased them about five times now since 2016, and they go up substantially every single time. Uh, in fact, I believe they're even higher now than what's shown on that screen, and I can update that again. So definitely uh, important to know, just like all areas of compliance, OSHA has teeth, and where we may not see we have a lot of risk in our uh, facilities, certainly there is some, uh, and to that end, OSHA has a very, very extensive and broad category of areas that facilities of all different types, because this is not just for healthcare, but this is really for all industry, all businesses. There's, there are just a couple of uh, types of businesses that aren't included under this OSHA umbrella, but um, and certainly healthcare is not one of them, but there are what they call standards. And so OSHA has standards that apply to different types of businesses. And from this, I have pulled uh, what would those common standards would be for healthcare. And I'm just gonna give you a quick summary of what that would look like. The first one is hazard communication. And so this is related to um, if you, let's say you have an x-ray machine and uh, you know there's a spill of the x-ray fluid. That would be something of you know how do we clean that up? What steps do we need to take? Who do we communicate to? How do we communicate? Uh, how do we dispose of this? what uh, equipment do we need in order to properly clean it up to prevent any injury, illness, those types of things. Um, the exit route standard is addressing uh, what happens if there's a car that drives into the front of our building and we have to evacuate, or if there's a fire or a tornado or you know a blizzard and all the electricity goes out or an earthquake, uh, whatever it is that would be related to your uh, particular region. Uh, what are the exit routes? Uh, this standard addresses how those need to be marked, how they need to be uh, lit, how they need to be unblocked, and it also addresses, uh, you know, how those exit routes uh, would need to be, where they would potentially lead to. I mean, you don't want to have an exit route that leads, you know, right to an elevator and then there's no electricity, right? And so it causes you to address those types of things to ensure um, an act, uh, safe evacuation in the event that needed to occur. 
Next, we have our safety data sheets, and this is also known as uh, material safety data sheets. And this is for really anything in your clinic with uh, a warning label on it. So it could be light bulbs, it could be uh, cleaning supplies, it could be x-ray chemical, anything with a warning label should have a safety data, data sheet. And this uh, is nothing more to than a summary of this is what this chemical or what this product is. This is how it's supposed to be used in order to be used safely. This is how it's supposed to be stored in order to be properly stored and not causing any uh, other types of risk around us. This is the steps to take should it come in contact with eyes, open wounds, or something along those lines. And so it gives specific instructions and detail on every single you know, cleaning supply, your x-ray chemicals, all of those types of things. And you should have all of that in a manual. So if and when something occurs, that's your first go-to as to how do I uh, make sure to address this, you know, whatever it is that was, you know, spilled or that got into, you know, a cut on my hand or something like that. How do I address this safely to minimize risk? And so risk of, again, injury, illness, those types of things to our workforce. Next, we have the emergency action plan. And this emergency action plan is specifically addressing what steps do we take in the event uh, there's an emergency. So, uh, for example, maybe we have, uh, you know, our office is filling up with smoke. How do we address that? Where, what do we do as far as calling for help? Who's allowed to do that? What if there's a fire inside of our office? Uh, does everyone know how to use fire extinguishers, know where they're located, all of those types of things. And so it's addressing really um, that, and, and you'll see how many of these are, you know, closely connected to one another, but it's addressing how do we handle and specifically address uh, emergencies that are potentially to occur or have the chance of occurring at our facility in order to make sure that our workforce is safe. Next, we have ergonomics and uh, in our chiropractic practices, this is actually one of the areas where we do end up uh, potentially with uh, injuries. We often think of, you know, injury as, you know, a slip and a fall, those types of things, but injuries can also occur in repetition over a period of time. And so just like your, your your docs often probably tell you that, you know, it makes after a period of time, their bodies get sore, their arms, their backs and things like that because they're bent over patients all day long. Uh, and that's repetition. So that's an ergonomic thing that has to do with their job. So the same thing with those of us in my, I'll just use myself as an example. I, uh, am, I do billing all the time. And so I'm sitting staring at screens all day long every day. I'm not very tall. And so if my chair is too high, my feet don't really hit the floor. And after a while, my knees start to hurt, all those types of things. And so the ergonomics would be uh, based upon every individual role in your clinic, uh, what potential uh, issues may occur even by repetition that could cause maybe headaches, blurred vision, uh, you know, carpal tunnel, those knee pain, back pain, neck pain, all of those types of things that may occur over a period of time. And having done this for 25 years, I definitely can say I get some aches and pains these days that I didn't used to. And granted, not all of it is because of, of these types of things, but I'm certainly some of it is because I've you know been doing this for such a long time. And so there is an ergonomic element to that that is uh, related under this. It's covered specifically under these OSHA guidelines. So it walks you through how to address those specifically for every single role in your clinic. Next, we have our medical and first aid. One of the things I always like to ask clinics is, do you have a first aid kit? And if so, do you know where it is? And do you know if you know the Neosporin is not expired and you're not out of Band-Aids or gauze or something like that? And so this is important to address that. So when something happens that potentially can be addressed in the clinic that doesn't have to have, you know, it could be, you know, paper cuts and things along those lines that, uh, you know, how, how, what do you have to address this with first aid? And is this first aid kit or first aid kits rather uh, properly evaluated on a periodic basis to ensure that all of the content that should be in them is there and it's accessible and does all of your team know where these are located? So if it's you know, under the sink, somewhere in the storage room, nobody even really knows you have to dig for it. Someone could be standing there, you know, bleeding for quite a little while before that gets figured out. So uh, that also is covered under OSHA. 
Next is the parking lot rule. And this is really just a pretty broad rule that just says parking lot to parking lot. So from the time your workforce pulls up to park, to go into work, uh, is the parking area well lit? Are the sidewalks free of cracks and potholes, broken glass and different things like that that could cause some type of injury on their way in and out of the office? Uh, you know, and this and questions that come up from this, which we won't have time to address today, but one of them is certainly, well, what if we don't own our facility? This is, you know, again, something that providers still or the clinic owner is responsible for making sure this is addressed in your OSHA policy, even though someone else or another company or individual may be responsible for helping to ensure those things uh, are at a safe standard. PPE is our personal protective equipment, and so this is you know, rubber gloves, gowns, caps, those types of things that we might use, but it also addresses the things we don't necessarily think of. How do we uh, pick up and dispose of dirty diapers? How do we um, clean uh, our treatment tables from patients that come in that are maybe sick and those types of things? And so do we have personal protective equipment? Where is it located? How do we use it? How do we dispose of it? All that kind of stuff. Or how do we get it to where if it's laundered, what are the steps for that? Next is the fire safety standard, and this is specifically addressing um, our um, fire extinguishers, making sure that we know how to use them, who's allowed to use them, where they're located, what specifically they're for, are they up to date so they would be safe to use in the event that it's needed, those types of things under that standard. And then finally, we have the general duty clause, and that general duty clause specifically says uh, because OSHA is so broad and for so much industry, the general duty clause says, we already know under our OSHA guidelines that there's no possible way to predict anything and everything that could possibly happen. And so because of that, in the event of an investigation or an evaluation, if we identify a potential risk to the workforce that isn't covered under other standards, then we're able to address it and penalize for it under the general duty clause. And so that really is kind of that all encompassing, if it's not specified somewhere else, but there's a risk, they can use the general duty clause. And I have actually seen that happen one time. It wasn't a chiropractic facility, but I did see that occur one time. And I thought that was incredibly um, interesting and a, a good, you know, just learning situation for me of in watching this unfold with that other type of facility, because, uh, you know, it's it's just it's also interesting how it comes together and the things that we we know or should know, right? Uh, so the summary of it here before I pass this on to Natasha is we want to just make sure that we understand that our risk uh, management and the implementation of these protocols is really a process, not a project. And so we do have that responsibility to make sure that we are you know being proactive in all of uh, those types of areas, which includes periodic review, training, proper documentation, all of the things that we have just um, you know, really been covering from end to end. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and just pass this over to Natasha for the HIPAA component. And thank you so much for joining me for OIG and OSHA. Thank you so much, Brandy. So we're gonna continue on with um, HIPAA. I'm just gonna switch our screens here. All right, perfect. So HIPAA is a set of national standards that for safeguarding patient health information privacy and compliance with HIPAA is essential to avoid financial penalties. It's also important for compliance officers to understand that their responsibility is to secure data to minimize the financial risk to the organization and HIPAA Regulates data exchanged between systems and authorizations for accessing medical records. When can we say we are HIPAA compliant? This is one of the number one questions that I get, and it's something that, uh, you know, it's hard to define sometimes for people. There is no definitive answer when it comes to this. However, based on what we see with from the Office of Civil Rights, an organization will be considered HIPAA compliant if they make a good faith effort. 
which we can generally include uh, some of these following items to become HIPAA compliant. One is performing a security risk analysis, and this is something that should be completed on a yearly basis, as well as uh, maintaining a risk management process and procedures, creating policies and procedures within the organization, having up-to-date business associate agreements, continued training for employees, as well as documentation, logs and audits that support your policies and procedures that you've implemented. Now, covered entities are health care providers, health insurance plans, and health care clearing houses. These are considered CEs, and they are involved in the direct creation of PHI and must comply with HIPAA regulations to the full extent. So, um, one of the things that you have to do in order to be HIPAA compliant and follow the security and privacy rules is to follow a set of safe safeguards. Those safeguards are administrative, physical, and technical. And to be considered HIPAA compliant, you have to adhere to these three safeguards. Administrative safeguards are about half um, of your policies when it comes to HIPAA. It's the first bulk of them. And normally when I work with offices, we tackle these first to just get them out of the way. And one of the things is implementing a security management policy having a security officer in place and having them sign a document showing that they are going to be the assigned security officer. Also having outlined what your workforce security is going to be for different policies regarding workforce members. Also having outlined information access and access management protocols. So how information is going to be accessed and what your employees have access to and making sure that that's segregated for each employee. Conducting security awareness training on a yearly basis as well as an ongoing basis. Security incident procedures, what are those processes? You need to have uh, that outlined and have a incident team in place in case there is a breach. Having contingency planning protocols in place, this would be for in, when you're talking about HIPAA, everything's through the lens of protecting health information. So when you're creating your contingency planning, your emergency operations, your data backup plans, things of that nature, um, it's always going to be surrounded around how to protect patient health information, as well as having up-to-date business associate agreement contracts. When we're looking at physical um, safeguards, we're looking more at facility access controls, workstation use policy, uh, workstation security, device management controls, so more of the physicality, how people are entering your facility, do you have a visitor's log when people are coming into your organization that are non-employees and non-business associates, how are you tracking their whereabouts, etc. And then we have technical safeguards, which is more like access controls, audit controls, um, integrity policies, uh, identity authentication and transmission security. So you're responsible for how information is transmitted and received and stored within your organization. You have to have that detailed and how that's done and what you're doing to minimize um, any unauthorized access of that information. And you're doing that not only through self auditing, but also systems that your IT provider can give you to maintain and protect your systems. So some of the policies uh, that you want to incorporate to echo the 18 HIPAA policies is definitely fulfilling a security risk assessment minimum every other year. I always say every year because in most organizations, you're not going to remember all the changes and things that have happened over a two-year span. So completing one on a yearly basis just can, keeps things clean and concise. Also performing access reviews. You have to know how information is accessed within your organization, not only through your systems, but what your employees are accessing and what you're giving them access to, as well as making sure that they're updating their passwords and that you have some type of password updates and complexity and that you've gone through that with your staff and that they understand that they need to be changing their passwords on a regular basis, anywhere between 30, 60, and 90 days. 
The same thing goes with termination policies. Every office should have outlined policy as to what your termination procedures are when a uh, employee is terminated or leaves the organization, as well as having a checklist of all the items that an employee has access to physical and technical and you're supposed to check those off and keep a log of that when they were removed when somebody leaves your organization also you're supposed to be performing system audits and keeping those maintained system audits are go above and beyond what your um, maybe your firewall or your software is doing it's an actual human person checking your systems to see if anything unusual is occurring and you're supposed to perform this bi-weekly or monthly within your organization and keep logs to track that and you should at least be picking a random 24-hour period um, just to make sure that everything looks okay and that you don't see any kind of malicious intent being performed uh, again, recapping contingency planning, you need to have an emergency operations plan, a disaster recovery plan, and a data backup plan in order to fulfill the contingency planning requirements. And those are all, again, echoing how your how everything is set up for data to be protected and also data to be exchanged, your technical processes, et cetera, in regards to a disaster emergency. Media disposal policies and logs, it's very important that you keep detailed records of how you dispose any uh, patient data via electronic hard copies. You're supposed to keep logs and, temp, uh, and have a policy in place. You should also, anytime anything is destroyed um, or disposed of, you're supposed to indicate what type of disposal that was, when it was done, who performed it, what items were disposed, and if there was any additional backups made of those items. Also, you should have a um, set of staff policies that have been implemented and that your staff have acknowledged and signed off on, besides just having a security officer who's signed off that they will be uh, taking on that duty. Most staff policies should, re regards in regards to HIPAA, should be a sanction policy, workstation, or computer use policies. You can even have um, a cell phone policy in place, as well as bringing your own device policies for offices who have their staff bring in their own um, laptops or cell phones for use where they would be accessing uh, patient health information from. So just to recap PHI, uh, PHI stands for Protected Health Information, which refers to individually identifiable health information transmitted or maintained in any form or medium by a covered entity or its business associates. So it's very important that you understand that your main responsibility as a covered entity is to protect that patient health data the core of HIPAA regulations is to ensure that ownership of medical data is retained solely by the individual and allowing them to decide to grant access to others such as providers, family members, and um, if necessary, employers. So at any time, a patient can ask you to not uh, give out their specific medical information or data to who they deem so and if you ever have a patient request this you should have the correct forms for them to fill out that request also only the individual has the right to grant access to their medical data for reasons such as privacy um, and uh, preventing discrimination also prevent protection and privacy comes into play once the individual has been uniquely identified so the moment that you create a patient record you're uniquely identifying them so that encompasses all their information from diagnosis name date of birth any payment information they've provided you um, so on and so forth personal personally identifiable information or PII includes any data that could potentially identify a specific individual. This is encompassing information that can be used to dis distinguish one person from another. So again, when you're once you create a patient file or create patient health information within your organization, it's considered PHI um, or PII.
there are 18 individually unique data elements that are considered um, that should be redacted or or protected when it comes to HIPAA. So if you are sharing any kind of information um, with anyone that is not a business associate with you, you're supposed to uh, redact this, these 18 individual unique data elements. So that's why it's so much easier to just get a business associate agreement with an organization. Not only does it protect you um, if there's a breach on their end, but also, you don't have to be blacking out or redacting any of this information uh, when you're sharing that with your business associate. So that starts with a person's name, as well as everything in regards to geographic locators. So that street address, city, precinct, zip code, longitude and um, latitude and longitude coordinates, that encompasses all of those aspects, as well as any dates. So this is any specific dates uh, for an individual, birthday, marriage, um, discharge dates, any of those apply as well. It also applies to their phone and fax numbers, email addresses, social security numbers, as well as the medical record number that you create, even though it is a random number. If someone knows the facility uh, that that number was created at, it would be easy for them to infiltrate and gain access to that information. So again, the same applies with that, as well as health plan beneficiary numbers. <clears throat> any account numbers that you have in your system, as well as license and certificate numbers. Uh, for PI offices, that also includes vehicle identifiers and serial numbers, including license plate information. Uh, it, so if you're a PI organization that is gathering that, that also falls within those identifiers. Uh, we really don't run into I, I, device identifiers and serial numbers in chiropractic, but if you're in an integrated office where you uh, come across this and that's in the patient's file, that also applies. Uh, they, it also encompasses any URLs and IP addresses and any biometric identifiers. This includes fingerprinting, voice prints, uh, as well as full face photographic images and any comparable images. And the last one is any or other unique identifying numbers or characteristics or codes. So anything that is created in regards to that all fall under the removal of specific identifiers. So this list here, if you weren't, um, if you didn't have a BAA with an organization and you needed to share a patient's uh, file, you'd have to remove all these items from the file before you could share that information. So it's best to just make sure that you follow the rules and um, comply. When it comes to business associates, uh, any organization hired by a CE or other BA who will necessarily encounter PHI over the course of the work they've been hired to perform or Common examples are going to be IT providers, practice management firms, um, any type of physical storage facilities, cloud storage facilities, email encryption, email providers, data backup, um, billing companies, the list goes on and on. Uh, obviously, most cases it's going to be your EHR provider that you share patient health information with and any practice management software that you have. But it could be a variety of different organizations as well as if you have like a voice, um, like a company that answers your phone systems for you and they're collecting any patient health information on those calls, things of that nature. Who do I need a business associate agreement with? Uh, one of the problems is I noticed that most offices get BAAs from their cleaning company, or um, they've asked the postman to fill one out. Most of the time, they are not going to be a business associate. They are not coming across patient health information uh, directly. It could be incident too. So if you do have a janitorial service that's in your organization that's coming in to do cleaning, you can always have a special Dropbox that would be indicated for them in case some information was left out that they could put it in and then you could mark that. But 
for the most part, a anyone who's outside of that business associate agreement scope, they would more be signing a visitor's log or other types of forms because they don't necessarily fall within the business associate uh, realm because they don't have direct contact with protected health information. So you're gonna wanna stick more with like your IT providers, any billing companies, EHR, that kind of thing. When would we have to update a BAA? So uh, as long as your BAA is effective before uh, 2013, I mean, after 2013, then you're okay. If it's before that date, then I would suggest getting an updated one from the business associate that you're doing business with. There was a major change with the omnibus rule that actually uh, specified the some role changes that they had made. So since this change, you're going to want to make sure that you have an updated BAA with any organization, and you should have a log where you have all the BAAs that you have, the date of those contracts, so that it's easy for you to scan that and see which ones are missing so you can contact those providers directly. Okay, so we're going to jump into data breach notifications. Data breach uh, notification rule is that the breach notification rule outlines the process that HIPAA beholds entities must follow in the event of a data breach. Depending on number of individuals affected by the given breach, the rule requires different timelines and notification standards. Um, to comply with the HIPAA breach notification rule, it is essential to have written policies and procedures regarding breach notification processes. Also, all staff should understand a breach and how to notify the security officer if they think a breach has occurred. Every employee should sign a sanction policy. This policy Policy's purpose is to ensure staff members understand that if they fail to comply with security policies and procedures, it can result in disciplinary action. So a lot of times when I work with offices, they're surprised that they have to report a breach if it's under 500 records. HIPAA requires you to notify them of any breach. It doesn't matter if it's one patient file or 5,000 patient files, you do have to report it. Uh, but there are some different rules if the breaches are under 500 records, uh, that is one of the cutoff points. And if that is the case, then what you can do is you can wait a little bit longer to report that to the government. You have, that, you have the availability to report that on an annual basis and that's due no later than March the 1st, as well, instead of it being the uh, within 60 days if it was over 500 records. Okay, so what is the difference between a security incident and a breach? So anytime a security officer suspects that somehow protected health information has been uh, breached or unauthorized information has been disclosed, it is their responsibility to start an investigation and to follow that investigation all the way through until they determine if it was a breach or just an incident. If it's a breach, then you have to follow the requirements of reporting it, not only on the state level, if you have uh, state requirements like Florida, California, and some other states have state level requirements that supersede HIPAA, and you have to um, let them know sooner. Otherwise, you would just follow uh, the regular HIPAA requirements to notify them of the breach. If not, you're just going to go ahead and keep that in your logs that you've report, you know, that an investigation was performed and it was deemed that it was not a breach. So lastly, just want to remind you when it comes to compliance, it's okay to ask an expert. Uh, HIPAA actually suggests that you should get assistance from an expert when performing your risk assessment and other HIPAA requirements. The same thing goes for OIG and OSHA. You should always have an expert that you can fall back on to help you with certain questions or specific requirements, or sometimes you just have specific things going on in the office. You just want clarification to make sure you're doing things right, but you should have a good overall view of what you're currently doing and then seek out an expert to help you and guide you through the processes. 
So finally, a goal without a plan is just a wish. You should definitely have a plan in place when it comes to compliance and outline that and be working towards compliancy on a regular basis. You are making a good faith effort to be compliant and to show the government that you're working on compliancy on a regular basis and you should be documenting that and keeping that um, in your compliance manual. So as we uh, come towards the end here, just remember if you have any questions or like to set up a consultation with myself, Dr. Kotler, Brandy, feel free to do so. You can scan our QR codes to access our calendars directly, or you can just always email us at info at targetcoding.com or give us a call at 1-800-270-7044. Target Coding offers a variety of services from products to compliance programs. We have a guidebook that helps with diagnosis pointing and linking. We also have our customizable forms, which also includes over 23 HIPAA forms that if you are looking for specific HIPAA forms, you can check out our website or watch our YouTube video on our forms pack. We also have a variety of memberships to help offices with exactly what we've been talking about for these couple sessions here, helping you not only with compliance, but with billing, coding, proper documentation, creating policies and procedures. And we do that through a variety of um, ways, depending on what membership you're interested in. We also have one-on-one -on -one consulting services, one-on-one -on -one on on-site trainings and audit prevention programs. One of my favorite is our chiropractic chart review program. It really um, gives you a bird's eye view of not only your documentation, but your coding, your billing, the forms you're using, how to understand insurance policies that you're in network with or that you're enrolled with. And just it's just a great um, insight on what you're currently doing and where to where you need to be giving some additional attention. Also, if you just got questions and you want to just pick Dr. Kotler's brain, we do offer one on one consulting. You can schedule um, a whole hour block if you would like, or you can bank away your time for um, smaller segments of Q&A with Dr. Kotler. So that's always a great option. If you are interested in handing off your compliance to someone else, you can definitely contact Target Coding. We can help you not only with a full, robust HIPAA compliance program, as well as a Medicare OIG program, but we also offer um, different types of manuals on billing compliance, OIG, uh, spinal decompression therapy, nurse practitioner compliance manuals, the list goes on and on. So if you're looking for specific compliance manuals that you need to integrate in your office, definitely let us know. We also have a uh, new set of destination seminars coming up. The next destination seminar that we have scheduled is going to be in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania on June the 27th for 12 CEUs and as well as Charlotte, South Carolina on July 13th. So if you're interested in that, check out our website under the seminars tab for more detailed information and uh, you can go ahead register there uh, if you would like. I'm just going to include a little mini bonus module here on cybersecurity awareness because we are talking about HIPAA compliance and as the years have gone on you have noticed that HIPAA compliance has really morphed into cybersecurity and one of the things that uh, can prevent uh, a breach in your organization is making sure that your staff are changing their passwords on a regular basis. More than 80% of confirmed breaches are related to stolen, weak, or reused passwords. So you definitely wanna make sure that you are having trainings with your staff outlining guidelines on strong passwords. And we're gonna go through some quick tips for creating and saving your online passwords. Now you can use password managers, but um, one of the things if you're creating passwords is adding variety. Cybersecurity specialists suggest that a mix of letters, numbers, and symbols um, are important in creating a robust and strong password. Also, stay away from using simple words or things like your date of birth or your dog's name, 
uh, password123, things of that nature. Don't recycle your passwords. Reusing the same passwords allows cyber criminals to take advantage of you. And more, um, the more you reuse your passwords, the more likely that those accounts will get accessed by a cyber criminal. So you want to remember, especially in a medical organization, like with Medicare uh, websites, you have to change your password a lot of times every 60 days, and they don't let you repeat the same password. The system actually blocks you from doing so. So it's a good practice to um, start coming up with um, new passwords and not recycling the same ones. Make sure you stay away from personal information. Hackers can easily gather information from public sources, making it easier for them to crack your password and gain unauthorized access. One of the things that we notice is that um, not too long ago there was a Facebook hack where they were getting they were getting information from people through them filling out quizzes and other things online, um, and by gathering that information they were able to understand people's habits and words and things that they might use. And then hackers use that information to go ahead and um, uh, attack certain people's systems to try and gain access to their accounts. It's also important that you make it long. Cybersecurity specialists suggest using 12 character passwords. This is typically enough to protect your account for 34 years. So um, it's really important to make sure that you are creating a very complex password and uh, the, obviously by by using the tips that we're giving you today you'll be able to strengthen your password you can also use a password manager uh, password managers are great because they store and manage your login credentials securely and often provide features like password generation autofill and cross device synchronization to protect you from people gaining unauthorized access. Also, multi-factor authentication or MFA is a great way to protect your accounts, enabling MFA whenever possible and adding an extra layer of security to your accounts is really important. It's like adding a um, moat or drawbridge to your digital castle. So remember, check for software updates manufacturers often release updates to fix security vulnerabilities and enhance the overall security of their devices so don't to do updates it's really important when you receive those security updates that you perform them right away one of the five reasons to update your software is updates help patch security flaws updates can prevent or can provide increased uh, efficiency updates help to keep your personal and sensitive data safe it also helps to fix um, crashes and bugs and as well as using uh, outdated software may allow you to uh, pass along a virus so again thank you for joining us today if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to us we're here to help we'll see you next time for part two have a wonderful day